may my speech be firmly established in my mind may the mind to be firmly established in my speech may there be perfect correspondence between my thoughts words and actions may this self effulgent lord shine forth in my life may the truths of the scriptures come to me may not what i learn from them ever forsake me let me live my life day and night according to their teachings i shall speak what is appropriate i shall speak the truth may that protect me may that protect the teacher om peace 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 so the cause exists in and through the effect but the effect does not exist in the cause therefore the causality of the cause is lost because of the non existence of the effect and all of this we see through vichara a philosophical inquiry now what does this mean it sounds profound but also puzzling the teachings have been given we are almost at the end of the text so that te- all the teachings have been given and before concluding shankara acharya gives us it's as if the source code of advaita vedanta you know the basic methodology what exactly happens when advaita vedanta is taught the basic methodology of teaching advaita vedanta he is giving us this at the that's the last topic um to understand this we will use the familiar example of the uh, pot clay and pot so let's take that example in four stages when we understand the example remember it's not about pots not about clay it's about brahman and this world that we experience our real nature and what we experience ourselves to be or we what we think we are right now it's about that about the ultimate reality and this this universe but the pot example is used let's first understand this verse in terms of the pot example and the pot example actually will be mentioned by shankaracharya in the next verse itself he says use the example of the clay and the pot to understand what i've just told you so let's look at the example of the clay and the pot and understand this verse and then we'll apply it to our experience of the world and try to discover the absolute here and now itself it will be done in four stages imagine a pot in your mind do this thought experiment take a pot that stage 1 what do you have a pot now in stage 2 take this pot and now you introduce something called clay this pot we are told is an effect effect here means a product here remember cause and effect the words cause and effect are used in a special sense cause and effect means the material out of which something is produced is called the cause in sanskrit upadana karanam and the thing which is produced is called the effect so the material out of which something is made that material is called the cause very small, if you want to be even more specific it's called the material cause in sanskrit upadana karanam and what is produced is the effect so for example if you take this altar it's an altar but now you are told that it's an effect it has been produced so you have to ask the question what is the material cause you will find the material cause is wood this one it's the material out of which the altar is made similarly about the pot now we are told it's an effect immediately we ask what is it made of so the cause what is the material cause what's the substance out of which this effect is produced and the, we uh, we find that the substance is clay the potter has shaped formed this pot out of the substance clay 
So clay is the cause, material cause, and pot is the effect. Or in Sanskrit, clay is the karanam and the pot is the karyam. Karanam, karyam. Where do you find the cause? The question will be, where do you find the cause? The effect is here. You are holding it. Here is the effect. Where is the cause? Inside, Inside the effect. In and through the effect. In the very effect itself you find the cause. Here is the altar. Here itself you will find the cause wood. And when we touch it, we say touch wood. So, right here, here and now itself you can find the cause. The cause exists in the effect itself. So that is the second stage. That the, that the thing that you have got holding, that pot, it's an effect. It has a cause and the cause is in the effect. This is the second stage. And the verse actually starts with the second stage. It says, Karye karanatayata. Note that in the product, in and through the product, in hearing in the product, um, you will find the cause. So in the pot, you will find the clay. Alright. Now let's go to the third one. The th third stage. The third stage is, That when you look at the clay and the pot, you notice something interesting. That the pot is, not only the clay is in the pot, but the clay is not in the pot like, say you would store water in the pot or milk in the pot. Not like that. In fact, when you examine it, the, the pot is through and through clay only. When you touch the pot, you are touching clay. When you weigh the pot, you are weighing the clay. When you look at the pot on the top, it is clay. When you look at the bottom, it is clay. Examine inside, all around inside it is clay. All around it, outside it is clay. Every bit of the pot is clay. Are you with me? No problem so far? Now, then we are led to this question. Then, this is clay which I am holding. Where is the pot? Take that, uh, another step. That where is the where is the thing? You're talking about an effect called pot. But where is the effect called pot? Where is the substantial thing? Entity, reality called pot. So Swami, you're holding it. But we are holding clay. Which part of it is a pot? Then you will say that. Then we, we understand that the material is clay. But, alright, there is no substance called pot. There is no real entity like the clay. Under the second thing produced from the clay called pot. But the pot is a form. It is a particular form. It is a particular name, pot. A form, a name, pot. And of course, use. You can use it to store things, keep things. It can be empty, half full, full. You can put water in it, milk in it and so on. So it has a name, a form and a use. Nama Rupa Vyavahara. Now see, the original entity which you got in stage one, a thing called a pot, a very substantial thing called a pot, has been reduced to a name and a form and use. Nama Rupa Vyavahara. There is no thing called pot anymore. Look at the magic. It's philosophical magic. You're holding the pot, but there's no such thing called pot. No such thing called pot. Follow this carefully. No thing called pot. The thing is clay. Now you might argue, well, but there is a name, there is a form. The form is definitely there. Now the argument gets subtle. Is it there? Which is the form here? Show me a thing called a form. Without the clay, there is no form. A form of a particular shape, we can see it, no doubt. But that thing, the clay, is the form ever there in the clay? No. The form is not a substance. The form is not a thing. Nor is the name a thing. Nor is the usage a thing. Entity, reality, substantiality belongs to clay and clay alone. This reduction, this reduction, reduction means not physically. You are not pounding the pot into clay. The pot is exactly the way it is, without the slightest change. Only in knowledge, it's, it's a paradigm shift. Your whole point of view alters. 
Only in knowledge you see that the pot disappears into thin air and all that is left is a shape, a use and a name. This reducing an entity to nama rupa, name and form and vyavahara, use, transaction. This is called mithyatva nishchaya. The determination of the falsity. You might say, how is it false? False in a technical sense. In the sense that it has no independent existence of its own apart from the constituent clay. I'll repeat, apart from the constituent clay, the pot has no independent existence. Right? No? Have I lost you? <laughs> independent existence means simple. You take the uh, clay away, nothing will be left of the pot. Not even a shape. Will you think a ghostly shape will be left? Mm -hmm. Nothing will be left. Take the, take the altar, uh, the wood away from the altar, nothing will be left of the altar. So the, it is only a name and form. Pot is only name, form and use. Not a thing, not a real separate entity. This not being a substance into its, uh, unto itself, not being an independent entity, this is called falsity in Vedanta. Not having an existence of its own. Depending on the clay to appear. Without the clay, the pot cannot appear. Without the clay, the name pot cannot be used. Without the clay, the use also cannot be there. You can't keep anything if the clay is taken away. So, name, form and use are also dependent on the clay. There is no entity separate from the clay called pot. This is called mithyatva, falsity. The effect is false. The cause is real. Reality belongs to the clay, not to the pot. Reality belongs to the cause, not to the effect. There is, this is said in the second part of the verse, this is stage three. It says, Karane nehi karyata. In the cause, there is no effect. In the clay, there is no thing called a pot. Okay. Then finally, what happens? Fourth, last stage. Last stage is magic. So, the clay, we called it the cause and we called the pot an effect. But when now we realize there is no such real effect called the pot. There is no thing called a pot. There are not two things, clay and pot. That we can say clay is the cause and pot is the effect. Hmm. Parents and child, cause and effect, separate. They're, both of them are there. So the real effect has been made. But is there a real uh, pot produced by the clay? No. If there is no real effect produced by the cause, then why call clay the cause? If there is no effect, why will you call it a cause? What is it a cause of? What real thing is it a cause of? You can say it's the cause of the appearance of the pot. But is it a real thing? Has it produced a real thing? In that case, how can it be a real cause? So the clay is not a real cause. The causality of the clay is lost. The causality of the cause is lost. It's no longer a cause. When the effect is gone, gone means not that the pot is broken. We realize the pot has no substantiality of its own. In that case, it's not a real effect. We cannot say there's a real effect which has been produced. Then the clay is not really a cause either. Then what happens? The clay alone remains. There is no such reality called pot. Though the pot appears and you can continue to use it and call it a pot also. But you know there is no reality called a pot. The clay alone remains and you cannot call the clay a cause of the pot also. This is the conclusion. So you start with a pot and you still end up holding it, it still looks like a pot. But in your understanding you are starting with a pot and ending up with clay. And the process is first um, a temporary causality is superimposed there. A temporary causality, uh, an artificial cause-effect cause relationship is introduced in order to make us understand that clay alone is the reality. Why is it an artificial cause-effect? Because ultimately we'll see there's no real effect, there's, so there's no real cause either. In order to make us understand clay alone is real, part is an appearance. Okay. And all this is done vicharata by inquiry 
by the by the philosophical inquiry by inquiring into the nature of this this entity called a pot it is not done physically you don't smash the pot into clay that i i will now have clay only which means the pot is gone i pound it into clay or break it no i dissolve it no it remains as a you can still continue to call it a pot you can use it as a pot it still looks like a pot talks and walks like a pot also but you know that it is clay alone and you think is it a pottery class or a vedanta class <laughs> all right now we are ready to apply it the uh, idea is now when you apply it to vedanta uh, to to our experience of the world brahman is consciousness the the way it will be applied is first take the world like you have taken the pot stage 1 four stages stage 1 take the world and then you will be told that brahman there is a cause of the world the world is an effect and there is a cause what is the cause brahman and then you will see, examine this world which you are experiencing and come to the realization that every bit of what you experience is brahman there is no separate entity called the world so the world becomes a name and a form and a use nama roopa vyavahara only in other words mithya false if the effect is false world is false then its cause brahman cannot be a cause remember brahman is not false but its causality is false brahman is not false but its causality with respect to the world is false it did not produce a world did not pro- produce a separate reality called the world that there are two realities brahman cause world real um, effect number 1 reality is brahman which is the cause number 2 effect is world which is the effect no not like this you will realize every bit of the world is brahman and therefore there is no such separate reality called the world it is just name and form and use nama roopa vyavahara and therefore the world is mithya false brahman alone is real if brahman alone is real and the world is false then brahman cannot be called a cause the causality of brahman is also lost so what happens brahman alone remains this is called brahma satyam jagat mithya and one thing is not mentioned here which will be added later on this brahman is you so the famous saying brahma satyam jagat mithya jeeva brahmai vanapara brahman alone is real the world is an appearance and you might say so what's it what's it to me this brahman which is the ultimate reality of the world is you you alone are real you means the real you that alone is real you alone are real as existence consciousness place and this world and body and mind and the life that we are leading they are all appearances of that reality so this is the the method that vedanta uses now you will say all that's fine as far as the pot and clay example is used you understand the four stages hmm do you uh, first take the pot stage 1 second the pot pot is an effect and clay is the cause second stage third stage examine the effect examine the pot which you are holding find out the clay in it you will find all through it is only clay every bit of it is only clay there is no thing called a pot so in the third stage the pot is falsified and we realize clay alone is real and the fourth stage is that if clay alone is real there is no reality called pot cause alone is real there is no re- uh, real effect then why call it a cause it's not really a cause because it did not really produce an effect so it's not really a cause clay alone remains without its causality these are the four stages at any stage any problem at least in the thinking in the understanding in the yes uh, so the pot is made of clay that yes. is clear yes but there is another thing that is involved which is language and our understanding nama rupa vyavahara yes. which is what we created yes our, our idea our language has this concept of pot being so is that also not a reality i mean the fact that it exists as an idea in our brains And right you combine that with the physical reality of clay mm. that for that is what form the pot right. and my my other question is that what is this uh, what is something similar to uh, this idea in in the example of brahman and uh, consciousness 
or rather the drama and the physical reality. Before. Right, right. So what is the analog of this idea of Mahabharata mm Vyavahara? -hmm. How does that come about in the, in the, uh, in the example of, of Brahman? So it Brahman and the world, uh, Brahman and the world, yeah. Brahman and the universe yeah. is not the example. It's the exemplified. So it's, it's what we are trying to understand. Right. It's not an example. What is the example is pot and clay. Yeah. I understand what you are saying. Yeah. Remember, don't bring in the uh, concept that okay, we are there is a pot and it's made of clay. But here we are conscious entities. We are thinking about it and we are adding that uh, there is a form and we have to use it. And here's a name called pot. It's language and thought and concept. Don't bring it into that because it's an example. Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Upoma Agdeshi. An example is meant to point to, to prove one thing. That in the pot there is nothing other than clay. If there's nothing other than clay, the clay is not really a cause of the pot because it's not a thing which is produced another thing. This much is okay. Now, your question also will be answered when we actually come to this Brahman and the world. Really the question should be this, I understand pot and clay, but when it comes to world and Brahman, what is the tricky part? What is the tricky part? The world is not the tricky part because the world is, I, I see, this is my world. Then, w w then if you say that, I have to see Brahman as the material out of which the world is made, will you not say, how? Uh, pardon? Diversity is difficult, the world is diverse and the one reality Brahman. But, you know, the question should always be, if you are actually following carefully, the question should always be, I understand what is wood in the altar. It's very clear to me. I know what is wood. I, I understand this. I know what is clay in a pot. I know what is water in, in, in the wave or gold in the ornament. But what is Brahman here? Shouldn't that be the question? First question. Or all of you can understand Brahman here. The, am I the only unlen, unenlightened one here? <laughs> all are Brahma Gyanis. Question should be that I can appreciate what you mean when you say altar. I can also clearly understand what you mean when you say wood. When you show me a pot, I can clearly understand what you mean when you say pot and what you mean when you say clay, I also clearly understand. I have a clear understanding of clay. But when you say here is the world, I understand. Here is Brahman, what do you mean? Shouldn't that be the question? When I say, take, the, take your experience of the world, this universe, stage one. Stage two, it is an effect, Brahman is the cause. Where is the cause? The material cause will always be in the effect. So Brahman is here. Now, you, one can at this stage itself raise a question. That Brahman is here. Um, are you asking us to believe it or understand it? Or actually are you making a claim that it, it can be, it's absolutely clear? That this is Brahman. If it is absolutely clear, you can as, as well pack up and go. Because then you are all enlightened people. Then only one can proceed to the third stage. That every bit of this is Brahman. There is no separate thing called the world. The world is an appearance, Brahman is the reality. And therefore, then we can go to the fourth stage, that Brahman is not really a cause, though there is no such separate entity called the world, no effect, so Brahman is not really a cause. Beyond cause and effect, Brahman alone exists. Four stages. But all of this is contingent upon understanding what Brahman is in our experience. Am I, am I making sense to you? Isn't this the vital question? Shouldn't the vital question be, show us Brahman here and now? I, anybody who understands what wood is, will understand where, where is wood. Anybody who understands what clay is, will understand where is the clay in the pot. Now, how will I understand or appreciate Brahman in this? Alright, I'll show you. Advaita says it's actually, once you... Understand it, it's actually a pretty simple claim. Whether you're convinced by it or not is a different thing. But actually it's a very simple claim. Start with experience. In Vedanta, one Swami was put it very beautifully. Anubhav se shuru karo. Jad se shuru mat karo. Jad se shuru karoge to jad hi milega. 
start with your experience living experience don't start with an isolated insentient object if you start with an object you will get only an object but start with your experience then you, the way back to brahman is is uh, is clear is easy what do i mean by starting with experience i mean stick to the truth when i show you this book when i show you this book you may say what is it it's it's a book but a more honest more comprehensive answer would be i am seeing a book correct no i am giving you two two sentences this is a book second sentence i am seeing a book which is more correct i am seeing a book this is a universe statement 1 statement 2 is a universe in my experience or i am experiencing a universe universe means world other people events my own body my own mind feelings my life all of it is something that i am experiencing is it correct or not yeah. right what advaita says is the next step is simple all of that what you experience it comes in through your sense organs you either see things or hear things or smell or touch or taste or it's an internal experience you have thoughts and ideas and uh, memories and desires yeah. urges feelings this is our this is, these are the materials the constituents of our experience right this is the universe of our experience now all of it is in our awareness you cannot think of experience without awareness anubhava in sanskrit without chaitanya impossible can you be completely unconscious and yet experience anything so for example i feel very happy but i um, i am very happy but i don't feel it can you can you honestly hold both statements together i am very happy but i don't feel any of it if you don't feel it can you be happy so in the case of happiness or misery it must be felt it must be within awareness and what vedanta says is if you think carefully everything in your life is within your awareness i'll even drop the your everything in life in your life is within awareness and vedanta goes further and says all that is within awareness is all revealed by your awareness or revealed by awareness it is all nothing different from awareness look at the statements all things in your life everything in your life in, including what you consider yourself to be is within awareness it is revealed by awareness it is nothing different from awareness if it was different from awareness you would not be aware of it it would not be part of your experience at all just like the pot is nothing different from clay this world of your experience the world the universe the life that you have is nothing different from consciousness from awareness from sentience this is the bold claim of advaita vedanta logically it cannot be challenged now your question is answered nama roopa vyavahara name form use concepts ideas language none of them are different from consciousness how can you have language without consciousness so i mean what i would like to ask here is that if clay is transformed into pot because of an idea so you had in a sense uh, the pot is clay but the idea formed the pot so in a sense we are we are uh, brahman and that i agree with i mean i do realize it through various you know talks so i am kind of convinced that yes at the base of our existence is consciousness but but it, it required an idea to convert clay to pot hmm. right or or language to convert clay to pot or used to con convert clay to pot what is the analog that converts brahman to exist oh all right the answer is very straight in advaita vedanta they will say maya yeah. there is an maya itself the constituents of maya are nama roopa 
There is a verse in Drik Drishya Viveka. Asti Bhati Priyam uh, Rupam Namam Cheti Angsha Panchakam Adhyatrayam Brahma Rupam Jagat Rupam Tatodvayam Our experience can be analyzed into five factors. What are the five factors? Isness, revealedness or experiencedness, shiningness, bhati. Priyam, we'll bracket that because that leads to controversy. Priyam means uh, 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 lovable or delightful or blissful. And name and form. The first three are Brahman. The other two, name and form, are Jagat. This name and form is the contribution of Maya. Maya has no separate existence apart from Brahman. Just as name and form have no separate existence apart from Brahman. Just as the, as the pot has no existence apart from clay. So Maya is not a second entity ontologically speaking apart from Brahman. Therefore it does not lead to dualism. Non-dualism is maintained. Because ultimately there is only one real independent entity that is Brahman. But to explain the appearance of a variety of names and forms, this bewildering richness of the universe, Maya is used, the concept of Maya is used. But when Advaita Vedanta says, Brahman alone is real, the world is false, or the universe is false. Remember the whole thrust is, on the question, what is real and what is false? Not what appears. Certainly the universe appears. Vedanta does not deny that. But is it real in the sense that Brahman is real? Certainly a pot appears. But is it real in the sense that clay is real? No, no. Clay alone is real. Because it's a substance. Now, in our experience, whatever we experience in the world, it is nothing other than consciousness. I'm using the words very precisely. It is no second thing apart from consciousness. Though it appears to be so many things. And indeed, more confusingly, consciousness appears to be one thing among many other things also. What happens is consciousness shines upon the mind and the mind appears conscious. And that's what we think consciousness is. So there is something conscious here and the non-conscious world of millions, billions of entities is here. So it's a plural world of billions of entities, including one thing called consciousness. No, Vedanta says if consciousness were to be understood properly, then you would see it is the very substance of the entire universe. It is the one reality which appears in all of these forms. Or it is the one reality in which all these forms appear, in which all these forms are experienced, and that which is not, the, uh, all the forms are not different from that. And that one reality of this universe, of this experienced universe, is consciousness which you are. Your essential reality is this consciousness. Today, see, it leads to, um, I mean, it's, it's an incredible claim, of course, very um, sort of all-encompassing claim. But it's interesting that a lot of discussion is beginning, not about this. This is too much for people to digest. Uh, because then... Everything else is put down to a lower grade of reality. Art and science and what we consider to be truth, all of that is put to a second order reality. The fundamental reality becomes consciousness. Pure consciousness, not thoughts. Today I, I uh, went to the Department of Philosophy in NYU. So some of the top minds of the world in, in this area, it's called the philosophy of mind. They, they, Tim Crane, there was a talk by Tim Crane, he's a British philosopher, he was visiting. The subject was behaviorism and, and psychologism. And, and uh, there were people like Ned Block and David Papineau and Kenneth uh, Appiah and uh, some others I did not recognize, but they were like the leading figures in, some of them well-known top philosophers today in the world and some of them the leading figures in the philosophy of mind. In fact, so much so, Tim Crane, who is himself a major figure, he was saying that it's an honor to be in this room with such people because 
And he says, I'm not being sycophantic. <laughs> uh, but it's a fact that you are the leading thinkers on this subject in the world today. And you know what's the subject they were discussing? The point of discussion today was that um, at one time, at the beginning of this century, um, in the middle of the century actually, uh, the, the whole idea was, the science was regarded as a model for studying anything. Truth comes from science. And one of the factors in science is being objective. Being objective means eliminating the subject. My personal consideration should not be as uh, a part of the study. The study should be objective. It should not have anything to do with any your inner life, which means your preferences, your thoughts, ideas, it should not be a part of it. Feelings, it should be completely objective. It's out there, a truth. Now, this is very good. But people forgot, this is good when you are studying objects. Certainly when you are studying objects, a subject should not be part of it. It will confuse things. But what about when you are studying the subject? The great uh, German philosopher, Frege, he, he coined this term, psychologism. Uh, he said, this psychological entities, he called it idea. So, thoughts, feelings, emotions, our own in, um, views, they should not form a part of our study. So, he said we should re remove, especially he was interested in removing psychologism from mathematics. So, psychologism in mathematics, psychologism in logic, so you should remove psychologism, make it a purely objective field of study. So this is, this is called psychologism. Psychologism means our inner psychological entities should not be confused with um, objects outside. And it's a good point. But what happened was, it was applied to psychology. So when you study the psychology, our inner person, then the psychology of the person should be left out of it. The subject should be left out of the study of the subject. Mm -hmm. When you put it like that, it sounds ridiculous, but it became like that. So it gave rise to a school of thought, very prominent school of thought. He right here, Watson was there. Um, who? Skinner, Skinner. Uh, behaviorism, where all of psychology, all of psychology is taken to be the behavior, the observed behavior of the subject. What you are thinking about is of no interest to me. What you do is of interest to me. So Skinner said, all of psychology can be understood. Today he gave a quote from a well-known psychologist in the 1930s. He says, all of psychology can be understood. Human psychology, he says. All of our psychology can be understood by observing a rat in a maze. What a horrifying thought. <laughs> Skinner said, behavior... It is stimulus, reward and punishment, stimulus and response, yeah, operant conditioning, all those things we learned, Thorndike, um, Skinner, we also learned it. He made the claim, give me a child in its formative years and whatever you want the child to be, engineer, doctor, thief, murderer, I will make him. <laughs> Just by reward and punishment, operant conditioning. So that is behaviorism. What are, what are thoughts and feelings, inner person, hey, no such thing, or whether it's, if it's there, if it is there, it is not the subject of psychology. Psychology, your inner psyche is not the subject of psychology. To that point it came. What a ridiculous point. Why? Because the original guiding principle is, if it is a science, it must be an observable thing, an objective thing, from which all subjective things have been eliminated. So to that point it came. And now anyway, now the point is, what has happened right now is, now people are very much interested in consciousness. And so today's topic was, this idea of eliminating psychologism from everything is, has, is proving as a great hurdle to understanding consciousness. Unless you take into account mental events, subjective events, how will you understand consciousness? It's like saying, I will study consciousness, but completely objective, removing consciousness from it. I'm going to st you study nothing, and therefore you come up with um, with views, 
uh, there are very smart people who come up with views like there is no such thing as consciousness. There is nothing, nothing called consciousness. So how can you say that? Uh, anyway, but they have a point of view because, but the basic impulse is that I have to remove everything subjective. But consciousness is the pure subject. If you remove everything subjective from your inner point of view, imagine. If you removed awareness, what would remain of your experience of the world? I am not saying what would remain of the world. I am asking what would remain of your experience of the world if you removed your awareness? It would go dark. In Sanskrit, in fact, there is a phrase, Jagat Andhya Prasangam. The blindness of the universe would ensue. Or the darkness, the universe would be covered in darkness. From your inner perspective, the whole perspective will disappear if that inner light is not there. Consciousness is not there. This whole issue has become very important just now because uh, uh, David Chalmers, who is here in the NYU Mind Brain Science, uh, Mind Brain Consciousness Unit, he has proposed that uh, this hard problem of consciousness, that how can we have physical entities like this body, how can it have internal subjective first person experience? That's the big question. It's called the hard problem of consciousness. And it's become such a big thing. If you Google it, it's all over the place. Philosophers are interested. Linguists today, there were people, there were cognitive scientists today. Uh, there, there was, um, uh, there were lingu- at least one linguist, uh, and so many people. There was even a, a play in London, a play, theatre called the Hard Problem of Consciousness. <laughs> so literature is interested. So many fields are coming together in this interest in the hard problem of consciousness. And David Chalmers, who is um, a philosopher in, the, uh, in uh, NYU, he proposes what is called panpsychism. Panpsychism means that we may have to admit, he says, we may have to admit that consciousness is as fundamental an entity in this universe as space, time, matter and energy. Remember, he is not coming from an Eastern philosophy, Buddhistic or Vedanta background, from a completely um, non-Eastern philosophy background, he's coming and saying that the evidence is driving us to this conclusion that we may have to accept consciousness as a fundamental reality of the universe. Even that is not Vedanta, that's Sankhya. That's exactly what Sankhya says. Consciousness is an independent reality and the universe is separate independent reality. Nature and consciousness, Purusha Prakriti. This is Sankhya an idea. Advaita is one step behind. Uh, one step b- behind means deeper than that, where you merge nature back into consciousness. See, in one way, it's just the opposite of materialist reductionism. In materialist reductionism, what is happening is, you are merging consciousness and mind into nature, into, into object. Subject is merged into object. Object alone is real. What am I? Nothing. Body is everything. Brain is everything. No, but my thoughts and feelings, nothing. Don't talk about it. Shame that you should talk about thoughts and feelings. So should I be thoughtless? That is perfect state to be thoughtless. <laughs> so all our uh, individual, and uh, that is either discounted or devalued or sought away, merged back into object. Subject into object is the materialist reductionist approach. Um, I mean, many of them would be so delighted if consciousness were to disappear altogether. Then the paradigm would be per- perfect. Matter, energy, this world is that, that's all that exists. Advaita is just the reverse. It merges the entire objective universe back into consciousness. Merges means you see it, vicharata. In what sense is the universe back merged into consciousness? Follow this carefully. Exactly in the same sense, the pot is merged back into the clay. Nothing happens to the pot. No change is there. It is realized to be clay, really speaking. Similarly, no change will be there in your experience of the universe. It will be just like this. You realize every bit of it is consciousness and you are that consciousness. Consciousness. 